Here we are on a Thursday night, 7 to 8 o'clock is my show, and this is called the Kishroni Hour. Yes, right here on Kishroni Hour on J Root Radio. And my name is Moshe Grunfall, right here with Nisim over here. Let me just tell you, you know, it's not your shows, it's their shows. Oh, I'm oh, it's sorry, their show. oh, yeah, yeah, it's big mistake. Shows. I, it's the kids' shows, guys, the guys, Kishroni no. shows. It's, this is the this yeah. is your your time, not my time. My time my time is all week. Your, now it's your time. So yeah, you can uh, call in to join. If you want to join, you can call in seven one eight five. Uh, where am I? Oh yeah, already a mistake. Seven one eight six eight. Okay, let me just let me just. Okay, I know that you. 718-683-5858, 718-683-5858, and if you are basically uh, <laughs> uh, want to, to participate with this uh, show, you can also text us to the number 347-927-8398, 347-927-8398. Uh, Moshe is like, that, that, you know, <laughs> uh, getting a... Uh, it was so throat, you know, with this. Okay. And if you want to listen to us, if you don't have any other devices to learn, like the Naki <clears throat> radio or like the other radio, you can listen to the three phone la- numbers that in, in the United States is 720-787-1046-720-787-1046 or 712-432-421-7712. 4217 and the other number the last number in the united states it's seven uh 718 506 9099 718 506 9099 and this is uh again this is uh kishoni hour with uh moish and moish we have a lot of surprise i see that i see that you have a lot of surprises for us the surprises oh yeah i got a lot happening anyways right here um uh yeah so uh basically oh thank you to the sponsors and yeah um please sponsor race of for courage go to this website not kids parents please go to raceforcourage.org and go to author tomsky and support and uh support her and helping make a difference for people with uh, for children who are uh, unfortunately can't go to regular camp and etc and yeah they are the they are the kids of courage they are the ones who are fighting uh illnesses and bez hashem hopefully one day we're gonna have somebody from Chaya lifeline uh one of the directors to be uh coming on one of these uh, weeks and right here, we're going to be talking about right now is the last week's riddle. Remember, we had a riddle last week. We are talking about a slave. A slave went through. He went free. A slave went free. And how did he go free? With, uh, and uh, somebody knocked out a tooth. The master knocked out the tooth. The, the person in charge of the slave knocked out his tooth. And now, now we want to know. This last week's question: What set of teeth are not uh, you're not chayiv? Well, here we go. It's called baby teeth. In case you didn't know, babies usually have this teeth, and therefore I uh, thought maybe everybody would know that one because baby teeth grow back. No, and dentures is not the answer. Sorry, whoever wrote dentures, it was wrong. Um. Anyways. This week's Parsha question. How did Moshe Rabbeinu know the shape of the menorah? Moshe Rabbeinu knew the shape of the menorah. Now we want to know how is it possible that Moshe knew the shape of the menorah? There was something special to that. If you know the answer to that question, you could text me 347 927 3279 and you'll be into a raffle to win amazing prizes. Sponsored by you of guys, of course. Um, yeah, and uh, please be Miss Follow for Alexander Zusha Ben Eliza Yisrael Ben Rachel. And well, tonight we're gonna talk about Rav Shapsai Kohn. Who was Rav Shapsai Kohn? Shapsai Kohn, he was a Kohen and he was a very, very, very big. I want to talk. Hey. 
Schmalky, where did you come from in the middle of the show? Come on. Oh, my goodness. I tell you, Schmelke always ruins it. No, I know. That was lushing her. Hey, Schmelke. Uh, Schmelke, I'm not inviting you. You said the same last week. Well, uh, this time we have Schmeril who's going to come in in a minute. Right, Schmeril? Yeah, come right now. All right. Okay, Schmeril. So we're going to talk about, you know what we're going to talk about, Schmeril? We're going to talk about Rev Shop Cohen. Do you know him? Yeah, he lived in my time. He lived in your time? Schmerl, you're a little boy. How could he be living in your time? Uh, I don't know. Huh? That's funny. He, uh, must have lived many years ago. Uh, yes, he did live many years ago. And his name was Rav Shapsai Cohen, you said? No, Rav Shapsai Hakoyin. Wow, that's such an amazing name. Yeah, it really is an amazing name. Uh, well, anyways, Beryl's gonna walk in in a minute. I don't want Beryl to walk in. He always makes... Oh, Schmelke, I didn't ask you. And soon we're gonna have, uh, soon, uh, as I said, coming in a few weeks, we're going to, as Hashem, have somebody from Chaya Lifeline, one of the heads, as Hashem, who's gonna talk to the Kindleach, to you guys, to you people, about what it's, you know, these people are talented, you know, you you may think a regular child, every child has their own talents, and guess what? These kids who are sitting in, uh, unfortunately, sitting in wheelchairs, have their own talents, and believe it or not, I happen to know a few of them, some of them play uh, a violin, one of them plays the, the clarinet, and another one plays a trumpet, so yeah, they, they are very talented, these type of people. These type of kids and then Bar Hashem, Hobeza Hashem, they we should have this person uh, come on. Anyways, Rav Shavsai Kain was one of the most prominent of all the Rabbanim and he lived in Lativan. Where was that? Oh, I have no clue. Of course, you do. It had it right there. Oh, right, of course. It's in the town of Prinsk. Oh, that's interesting. Pinsk? No, not Pinsk. Prinsk. Well, it was Prince. Oh, what was the town? Uh, what was the name of the town? I just told you, it was called Prince. Oh, <laughs> Prince. 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 No, not Pinsk. Come on. Prince. P R I N S K. Oh, <laughs> Prince. Oh, I got it. You did? Excellent. Now I can continue? I guess so. Well, Rabbi Hakoin is known by his famous name, the Cohen, the lips of the Cohen, and his abbreviated name. I'm sure all of you kids know this. All of everyone listening should know this one. As the Shach. He was known as the Shach, and he was young when he wrote the uh, Sefer. It led to him having a big reputation, and and yeah. He wasn't, yeah, and did you know something? He wasn't wealthy, so, you know, sometimes you say, well, eh, I'm not wealthy. How can I write a safer? Guess what? You don't have to be wealthy to write a safer. You have to just do what you got to do to write that safer. Yeah. His wife was sick, and after a period of uh, big pain, she passed away, and Rav Shafsi was forced to take care of the, a six-year-old daughter, Esther. Well... There was one day Rav Shafsi heard a terrible scream. Oh no! Kamu has come! The cruel Cossacks are close behind! Who was Hamil? Oh, you want to know who was Hamil? Well, Hamil, I guess, was a part of the Cossacks, and he was coming to uh, hurt the Yitin. Oh, okay. I just wanted to know who Hamil was. Well, now you got your answer, so now I can continue? Yes. And anyways, this is a very long story, so no interruption, Schmerl. And Schmelke is so nicely sitting here, right, Schmelke? Yeah, I'm sitting so nicely today. I'm going to... What are you going to do? Um, I'm going to stay quiet. Very good. And Beryl, you're here as well. So Beryl, you know, last week... What was last week? I don't remember. 
Well, last week we uh, spoke about different issues. Oh, issues? No, we didn't speak about issues. We spoke about different Tyra. Well, we always speak about Tyra here. Um, yeah. I can continue on my uh, story here. Now, without hesitation, Zerov went to his sick daughter, wrapped her quickly in a warm blanket, took her in her arms. You made a mistake. What a mistake did I say? Well, you said he took her in her arms. It's supposed to be his. Oh, come on, Shmeryl. You're not supposed to correct me on everything. The kids will hop. No, I don't think so. Okay, well. Well, you're, you're right, Shmeryl. So, the Rove took the sick daughter in his arms and ran away from the city. This happened on a Friday afternoon. A Friday afternoon? Yep, on a Friday afternoon. Oy vey, what did he do for Shabbos? Well, I don't know. It didn't say in the story what he did for Shabbos. Oh, I hope he has a refuge shlema. He has a refuge shlema. He wasn't sick. The daughter was sick. I hope the daughter has a refuge shlema. Well, I hope so too. And uh, talking about our refuge shlema, we have a few kids that are needed uh, in uh, uh, refuge shlema. And, well... Here uh, we go, some of them. Arye, Ari Lei Ben Bela Rachel, Arye Le Natana Bat Chana Zahava, Ben Yamazev Hakoyen Ben Sharona Rivka, Chaya Meir Ben Rina Lea, and a few more Yitzchak Beryl Ben Galit, and Yitzchak Avram Ben Shelly, and Yisrael Alter Ben Chava Chana. May they all have a Rafu Shalema, and yeah. Uh, thanks for reminding me, Shmerl. I didn't remind you. You reminded yourself. No, I didn't remind myself. You reminded me because you said uh, you said a uh, Rufu Shalema. Well, you said sick daughter. That's true because the Rav did have a sick daughter. Oh no, that's terrible. Of course, it's terrible. Well, you know what they say: if there, you know, if you have uh, a lot of suffering, sometimes it must be that he was a good person and he's getting his reward in Elam Abba. Wow. Yep. It's a big wow. Okay, so continue the story because it's getting boring. Hey, that's not nice. Come on. Don't say that to me. I don't I don't like being consulted like this. Yeah, so this story happened. Hey, you sent it about the story to sick donor. You remember you went to the part where you took her in the arms. Right. So he took the girl in the arms in his arms. And it happened to be on Friday. Rav Shavsi did not rest for a moment. He ran very wildly, very quickly, for hours in the snow, in the freezing snow. And as he ran, he heard the shouts of the Cossacks coming close. And they were coming. Oh no, the Cossacks! Cossacks, save us! Shmeryl, do you want to do one of the voices? Yeah, save us from the Cossacks! I said Shmeryl, not Beryl. Oh, okay. Well, Shmeryl, do one of the voices. Ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Oh, the Cossacks are coming. Help me. Oh, oh very good. Shmeryl, wow, that was unbelievable. Well, and the danger was so near, it forced Rav Shavsek to run with all his might until he finally reached a thick forest. Oh, no. That's terrible. Thick forest. He can't get through a thick forest. Well, actually, in this thick forest, he was able to get through. Oh, that's terrific. Hashem always has his ways. Yes, Hashem always has his ways. That's true. Hashem has always the way of helping out people. That's true. I agree with that. But sometimes it's hidden. Yes, Shmel, you're being very smart today. Sometimes the Hashem's ways are hidden. And yes, sometimes his nisim are hidden. Correct. Okay, so continue on the story. All right, I will. In the meanwhile, the day had ended and the time for receiving Shabbos, uh, the Shabbos uh, went. And what happened? Shabbos, stood where he was davening. In order to accept the start of the Shabbos, finding a small uh, place in his act that he was you know, running away. Imagine you're running away into the woods. You have no place to go for Shabbos. Here in Brooklyn, Baruch Hashem, we have such a nice... Such a sweet Jewish community, uh, friendly Jewish community. And um, 
this friendly community, you know, uh, everybody who uh, actually tonight talking about this community, anybody listening right now and you donate, you tell your mother to donate or parents or any one of the parents to donate $50 is being entered a raffle right now for uh, Naki Radio. And if you're listening to this on another week, you can text me at 347-927-3279. Wow, Shmerl, you knew my number. I didn't even say it to you. Yeah, well, yeah, I hear you every week. Okay, well. In the meanwhile, the day had ended and the time for Shabbos came. And Rav Shabbos stood where he davened in order to accept the start of Shabbos. And he was consoled about that. He was consoled that he was able to keep Shabbos in the forest. That's a uh, that's an unbelievable act. Anyways, all night long, Esther was having a, her big fever, and the desperate father was beside himself because he did not have any medication or any other treatment for his daughter. Nowadays, you know, you don't really think about this. Nowadays, what do we have? We have so much medication, and you know, you don't even think about these small little things. Like if somebody would have a fever right now, uh, we have an Advil to take away the pain. Those days, what did they have? They didn't have these much medication, and especially, um, especially when uh, you know running away. I mean, what can you have while running away? Right. What can you have running away? Well, I guess you can always have your puppets. As morning came, she fell asleep. Her breathing became less, and her trembling stopped. When the sun rose, Rav Shasti looked at his daughter, only to be shocked and to see. That she was not alive anymore. Suddenly, Rav Shasti jumped up. He heard the sounds of trumpets, followed by galloping horses and barking dogs. In his fear, he fled from the sight, leaving his daughter's body behind, and hid a short distance away. When everything goes quiet, Rav Shasti returned from his hiding place to where he had left his daughter's body in order to give a proper burial. But he was again shocked to see that her body was not there. Oh my goodness! What happened to her body? He searched all around in the snow, but could not find anything. Rav Shafsi fell to the ground and burst out in a deep crying. <laughs> My dear Esther, where are you? Won't I at least have the privilege of bringing you to a proper Jewish burial place? However, quickly his faith in Hashem returned, and he accepted what had happened as Hashem's judgment. Even if he didn't have anything else left, his commitment to Hashem and the Torah remained. From now on, he would consider himself sanctified to Hashem and to his Torah. But for now, let's us leave Rav Shafsi and see what really happened with Esther, the daughter of Rav Shafsi. Well, when Rav Shafsi ran away in the morning, it was not Cossacks that he heard, but rather the king of Poland who came to tour the uh, to come. He used to hunt in the forest. The king saw this little girl lying in the snow. He turned to his doctor and asked him to check the girl, see if she was alive. The doctor said the girl is indeed alive. She's simply in a very, very deep fainting spell. Let the king tell one of his servants to pick her up on his horse and perhaps we can save it. The king immediately signaled to one of the servants who picked the child up and quickly took her into the city. And when Esther was put in bed, she woke up from her deep faint. Esther was very slowly recovering. And she's turning to her former strength. And, uh, yeah. Impatiently, the king's sick your old daughter, Prince Maria. Not Prince. Uh, you're right, Princess Maria. Thank you, Shmerl. You're always correcting me, huh? And where's Shmelky? He's not correcting me. <laughs> Shmelky! I can't believe you. You're snoring? Princess Maria waited until she would be allowed to meet this girl who had been found in the forest, and when she finally saw Esther's pretty face, she fell deeply in love with her. After Esther became strong and told where she came from and how she was born to the forest, the people could not decide what to do with her. It was suggested that she be returned to the Yidden, but when Princess Maria heard this, she heard, she said, Oh no, Father! Don't take the forest girl away from me! And the Queen suggested, Let us... Let us make them uh, to our religion, the girl, and keep her in our home as long as Maria wants to keep her. Well, 
The king agreed to this, but the people of the king's court were very angry. When asked to refuse to eat any of the foods that was offered to her, when she was asked why, she said, God doesn't allow us to eat this type of food. Until now, I was sick. And I remember that while my mother was very sick, my father told her she could not eat anything that might have saved her life. But now I'm healthy, and I am only allowed to eat kosher food prepared by it. That very day, the king's personal priest came in to try to convince Esther to eat. He told her all about the good things she could have if she converted to the religion. He said, Your life was given back to you as a gift only because of the kindness of the king. Stands to reason that you belong to him. And you therefore must accept his faith and religion. When Esther heard this, she turned pale, and she put her face into her hands and cried, Please just leave me alone and let me die here. If you want to kill me, kill me now. She had heard many stories about holy men and women who had been killed by Cossacks, and she was convinced that she must give up her life and not convert to another religion. Her friend Maria heard her cry and ran into the room. She asked, But dear forest girl, why are you crying? Who is that that dares to hurt you? Esther didn't reply, but she made a sign with her hand toward the priest. And Maria asked, surprising, You priest! This is my sister that you're upsetting so badly. But the priest replied, No, I want to give her real happiness so that she will be able to re her sister to help you. And, uh, he shall be real to you. And, uh, you, Esther, don't you want this? Maria asked, And you, Esther, don't you want this? No, oh, my dear sister, Esther said. I want to remain in it. I want to there die and change religion. So uh, Maria went to her friend, kissed her, and wiped away tears. Calm down, Esther. Nobody will force you to do anything against your will. Come, let's go to the flower garden. And Esther began to smile. The two girls took a walk into the garden. Laughing together as nothing had happened, the king hired a Yiddish woman to bring Esther food every day. But the people of the king's court made sure that no Yid would ever get close to her in the hope that maybe she'll convert. Well, in the meanwhile, the friendship between Esther and Maria grew and grew. Esther joined Maria in her studies, and she often studied better than the princess. One day, Princess Maria was sitting on a bench in the garden. Suddenly, Esther jumped up with screaming fright. Ah! She grabbed Maria and quickly dragged her away from the bench. Well, on hearing the sound of the scream and the fright, a maid who was nearby came running. She managed to see a snake that had been about to bite the princess and that Esther managed to save Maria from the snake. The maid killed her with a stone. The terrified princess fell on Esther and hugged her. She said, I'm sorry to you, Esther, that I will never forget you. I'll always remember that you rescued me from this horrible death. Well... Uh, I think we're gonna take a little pause and we're gonna play the song from uh, as soon as uh, we're ready to play that song of uh, Mendy Jacobson. Ken, tell me what he wants. M Mendy Jacobson, the yeah. song Mendy Jacobson. No, yeah, that that would be great. And here is Mendy Jacobson with his beautiful song, and thank you, Mendy J. And uh, we're going to listen to it right now for those listening. For those listening, uh, yes, right? You know, I've told you I've prepared it before, and something was wrong. And well, so we're going to continue until uh, so continue. I want to add a song in the meantime. Uh, so we're going to continue until uh, Nissan finds that the until the my call my world my uh, buddy here Nissan. Hey, I'm not your buddy. I'm your boss. All right. Uh, okay. All right. Um, the king and queen who heard the story of the snake later could not find words to express their thanks to Esther. The queen wept and hugged Esther to her, to her so tightly. The king also had tears of joy in her eyes and he kissed Esther on the forehead. From that day on, all the people in the king's court. Loved very much Esther, and they all treated her with honor. Well, the years went by. Little by little, Esther forgot the childhood memories of her father's house. The elderly widow who bought Esther her kosher meals knew very little about Yishkai, and so Esther learned almost nothing about her Yishkai. But she also completely forgot Hebrew, which became a foreign language to her. Meanwhile, both girls reached the age of 12. 
As long as Esther was small, she still remembered her parents and the fact that she was yet. But now that she had grown, I was given respect by all people in the queen's court. She forgot that she was a Jew. And since she forgot to a Jew, it seemed like nothing more than a dream. And, well, sometimes dreams come true. And one day, Maria came to Esther. She hugged her and kissed her and said, My dear beloved Esther, how long must there be a division between us because of my sister and everything? Join me in my religion. Well, we're going to know Nisim. Are you found? Um, look, it's no. It disappeared. It disappeared. No. One second, I'm just trying to get it, you know. Uh, okay. Well, when Esther heard this, she released herself from Maria's hug. She, she Man, released Mandy her. Jacobson. Yeah, released herself from uh, from the hug, and she turned one way and another until she found a hidden quarter in the garden. She hid her face in her hands and began to think. In her memory, she could see her early days in her father's house. She saw the image of her mother lying sick in bed, and she could see her father sitting and studying a book of the Talmud. She only cried out, weeping, Should I give up this memory? Should I forget you, my dear parents? Her uh, heavy flow of tears helped the lessons of sadness in her heart, and she felt a touch on her shoulder. Uh, Adama. Oh, Adam. oh, I'm I'm so... Okay, I'm sorry. I'm just... I, have it. I, have, I, I know I just... Nisim so. had a hard day today. For those of you who want to hire Nisim, Nisim is Bar Hashem. He's a great uh, contractor, and I am I'm allowing you uh, uh, on my honor. You can mention me, uh, Moish Grunfeld, and uh, yeah, Nisim will give you a, a discount. And uh, yeah, he's a very good person to uh, help you out with your house, and he'll explain all your electricity. He'll hire the best people, hopefully. Um, I think uh, I think that I heard of many a lot of uh, feedback about that. Um, yeah. And anyways, well, when Esther heard this, so she ran away, and then she felt a touch on her shoulder. Maria had come, and she hugged her again. After a moment, saw Maria said softly, "Did I make you unhappy, my dear? You are and will always remain my sister, even if you will remain a yid, but." It will be worth your while to think about this. Remember, if you agree to accept my religion, the king will adopt you as my daughter. And you will remain here forever. You will marry a rich prince and live a life of luxury and glory. But what will happen to you if you return to life as a simple poor Jew? Well, Esther didn't reply. But she understood that she would not be able to resist the pressure for very long. And she did not know what to do. Well... During all this time, the priest had been trying to teach Esther about the religion and to convince her to convert, but he didn't succeed. The king also tried with love to to do make her, but... And anyways, here we go. We're going to interrupt this for this uh, song. <laughs>
Understand Hebrew. This is a, a talking about the uh-huh. earth and sky. Uh, the, 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 you know, the, the earth and the heaven. We are just if everything is in our and inside ourselves. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you for all, everything. Give us the song. And yeah. you know, uh, I know that uh, Mandy is supposed to be uh, what do you call it? Uh, your, your your guest, right? One. Uh, uh, visit Hashem uh, a few weeks, not this week. Uh, we'll hope for, to get him, and we hope to get the many more Bezaz Hashem. Um, anyways, on to our story, back to our story, this uh, Rav Shafsi Cohen story, and it's unbelievable, it really is an unbelievable story so far. We're up to the part where Maria uh, tried convincing Esther to become a guy, and, uh, but Esther didn't, uh, Esther didn't do it, and now, well, one time, he called, the king called Esther and promised to give her a huge money amount to choose a wealthy husband, but only on conditions that she doesn't be stubborn and converse. Esther did not reply, but she bent her head down. Tears dropped from her eyes and fell on the king's head. He kissed her on their forehead as the father kissed his daughter, thinking that she was ready. That night, Esther had trouble falling asleep. Finally, she slept and she dreamt that she saw her dying mother who opened her mouth and spoke in a very weak voice. No, my husband. That you and our daughter will have a very difficult and bitter experience as part of heaven. I will bow into the master to the boy Shalom that he'll send you an Amalek to save you from all the evil and all bad things and to rescue you from all the troubles. Master broke into a cry. Mother, mother, save me. Your daughter there is in great danger. Rescue me. Well, suddenly Esther heard a loud banging on the door and a screaming. Open the door, the pedal's on fire, save yourselves! Everybody started to run wildly to escape the fire. Now I have an opportunity to run. Now I have an opportunity to run away without being seen, Esther thought. She opened the window and climbed onto a nearby tree and she was on the ground with the moment. 
left. He went from the country a courtyard through a back door. Leading into an open field. No, I'm free. Esther said to herself as she happily moved towards the forest. All around it was dark, but the flames in the palace lit the way for her. She knew that the wolves and sometimes bab robbers, ganovim, kidnappers are in the forest. And she was very scared, but she said, It would be better to be caught by wolves or to be killed by robbers than to rebel against my uh, god Hashem and my people. Her shoes were torn and her feet became very tired, but she kept going and going. I think that song Adama means that everything comes from Hashem, no? Don't think so. What? The song Adama come, uh, means everything comes from Hashem, no? No, no, the, the more, more that something inside ourselves, you know, that everything comes from Hashem, but we are, ev that we have the heaven in us, we have the, the earth in us. Yeah, we get we buried have, in earth. We, uh -huh. Yeah, okay. Uh, we have, we let, we let, uh, what is his name? Uh, Mandy, to explain it when he comes. Oh, you know what, Mandy? You're invited to explain it as a shaman in a few weeks when you come, and uh, we're hoping you uh, take upon the invitation. Meanwhile, Princess Maria began to search, and she asked with fear in her voice, Where is Esther? Servants quickly searched for her, but they didn't find her. Everybody was sure that she died in the fire. She was thought to be oh, the only victim of the great fire. All of the members of the court were struck with sadness, and Maria could not stop crying and crying and weeping about her sister, Esther. And now, well, we're going to go back to the Shach. What is Rav Shafsi doing now? Well, after he couldn't find his daughter in the forest, he returned home. On his great faith in Hashem and his love for Torah, he managed to keep the strength. In spite of the death of his wife and the loss of his daughter, he left his empty house and began to wander around the countries of Lativa. What's Lativa? Well, Lativa was a country. Oh. And Latvia. Poland. Latvia. You hear that, Shmero? Nisim corrects me. Latvia. Latkes. No, not Latkes. Come on. Latvia. Latvia. Right. Of Latvia and Poland. He rejected many offers as a rabbi and remained dedicated to one mission. To find his daughter. After many years of wandering around, he began to lose. He finally accepted an offer as a chief rabbi of the city of Helshoi. I never heard of that city, but it must have been a good city. He married a second uh, wife who gave birth to a son, and his life began to return to normal. But he cannot see. He cannot. He cannot stop thinking about Esther. Right, Shmuel? Are you reading over my shoulders again? Yeah. Well, please don't, because I don't like when people read over my shoulders. How do you like if I read over your shoulders your homework? Uh, oh, yeah, I gotta do my homework. Well, you could do my you, you could do my homework as well. I do it every week. Oh, do you now? Yeah, who do you think does your typing? Um, I do it? No. No? Who does it? I do it. Okay. But he couldn't stop thinking about Esther. The Rav couldn't stop thinking about Esther, and every day he would dive with Hashem to return the daughter. One day, Rav Shasi had a visitor from Poland. During the meal, the guest described the life of the Yidden and the land, and specifically in Krakow, and he mentioned the amazing story of each girl in the king's palace. He enthusiastically described her courage in insisting that she would not eat food provided by the king, but only kosher food. Rav Shasi hoped merely rose. Do you know about how this girl came to be in the king's palace? Yes. And the guest replies, they say that the king found her half dead when she was when he was in the forest hunting one day. When Rav Shafse heard this, he knew he what he must do. The next day he rose early, went away and son uh, went away from his wife and son and started out to the capital city of Krakow. Rav Shafse journeyed to the palace. As he went, he remembered his childhood days in this area. This includes memories of his neighbor at the time, a Polish boy named Vartilislav. Oh, wow, that's an interesting name. What was he? Well, he was a, uh, a guy. Oh, that's interesting. Well, uh, years later, he had become deep in the depth and he was sent to prison. 
Or Chomsky heard about the prison sentence of a childhood friend. He was very upset. He paid the debt. So this man happened way before he became Rav. Well, since that time, he had not seen or heard about Vasilev at all. Deep in thought as he was, the Rav had lost his way in the fires. Night stopped. And he became very scared. He began preparations to sleep in the forest when he saw a fire in the distance. He started to walk in the direction of the light when he reached a large cave among the trees. Rav Shasi approached and looked inside and he was startled to see robbers sitting around the table drinking. He quickly moved back, but he was already surrounded by some of the bandits who brandished their swords and yelled, What are you looking for here? The rabbi replied in front, I I'm a wandering Jew. I lost my way in the forest. But one of the bandits shouted, Liar! You want to win? I by the whole authorities. We will have to kill you. The rabbi begged for his life and explained that he was only looking for a place to sleep. But nobody would listen to him. The bandits tied him to a, with a rope and took away everything that he had. And then one of them lifted his axe moving towards the rabbi Shasi. The rabbi began to say, Vidoy. Vidoy is something that you say right before, uh, right before, uh, right before you say Shachris. Um, no, not right before you say Shachris. You actually say it in Shachris. You actually say Vidoy on Yom Kippur. Right. And you say Vidoy before somebody's nifter. Right. Before somebody's nifter, he says Vidoy. Excellent, Shmerl. Well, at that one moment, one of the bandits jumped up forward and stopped his friend. Wait until our leader Vreslov arrives. He's the only one who has the authority to put somebody to death. And the first robber said, You're all right. He put the axe down and pushed Rev Shasi deeper into the cave. Suddenly there was a the sound of approaching horses. <laughs> the chief is coming, the bandits cried out, and they rushed to greet him. He turned to his colleague and they asked him, what did you find today? Was it gold, silver, or diamonds? And he said, no. All we managed to find was a young girl wandering around in the forest. Perhaps we can sell her to somebody and make money. Belish will bring her here soon. And then suddenly everybody was great shocked. From inside the cave, a crying out. Breath, love! And the chief shouted back, Who is it that dear calls me by my real name here? All the bandits were struck with fear, for they had never dared to use their chief's name. But then the same voice continued, Vratislav, save me! Just as I once saved you! And the anger drained from the chief's face as he said, Amazed, can this be? Do I hear the voice of my childhood friend, Shapti? Quickly, Vratislav freed Ref Shapti from his rope, hugged him with feeling, and said, Shapti! Shasi, you are the only person who ever had pity on me through all the time of suffering in my life, which forced me to become what I am today. The chief signaled his men to leave him alone with the Yid. Vratislav told his friend Rav Shasi everything that he had done, everything that happened. He had huge money debts, which brought him to a great discouragement. Uh, he became a, a chief of a robber. Shasi listened carefully and he was very sad to hear how his childhood friend became a bloodthirsty bandit. What does bloodthirsty mean? Well, bloodthirsty means that he drank blood. No, it doesn't. He's not a vampire. No, bloodthirsty means that he were, became uh, he became like a murderer. Oh, that's scary. Of course it's scary. Well, he spoke to him very seriously in a harsh way that reached into his neshama, into the soul about his terrible deeds and about how his soul would be lost because of the grave sins. The wise and convincing words of the rabbi had such an effect on the chief. And he lowered his face in his hands and he cried. But in the end, Vaslav sighed deeply and said, I can no longer leave this path. I'm linked to these men by strong bonds and we must continue on our path of robbery. My good friend Shapsi, go on your way in peace and pray for me. The chief then turned to one of the bands and said, Take this two to the main road. Remember, it will cost you your head if he suffers even a scratch. The next day, Rav Shapsi reached the site where the palace had stood. But now all remained. Since the palace was burnt, there was only a sm smoke and a fire. Shapsi asked the Yidden in the neighborhood about the fire, and one of them told him, The pretty girl Esther, the friend of the princess, was the only one who was killed in the fire. 
He did not understand why the stranger became so angry, uh, so upset, and fainted when he heard this. He woke up Shasta with great difficulty and spoke to him, and only then did he understand the great tragedy. The Rebbe had been on the verge of finding his lost daughter, and now it turned out that she's lost forever. This terrible tragedy happened just as the last minute, and his beloved daughter had burnt to death. Rav Shasta was at first very depressed and broken, but he overcame his shock. Well, all of Hashem's ways are righteous. Are we are tzaddik? Hashem is good in everything. Hashem nosan, Hashem lokach. He takes and he gives. Well, let Hashem's name be blessed. Shafi left the place in deep sorrow, went back to his home, and continued his Torah learning. Well, now we're going to talk about Esther. What happened to Esther that fled from the fire without even them knowing? Esther fled from the palace. She ran for a long time until she almost clapped when she heard a commanding voice. Stand still, little girl! She stopped in her tracks, shaking in fear. She saw a frightening pan pointing a rifle. She started to cry, Don't shoot me! Yes. Who are you? And she replied, I'm a poor girl, orphan from my father and mother, alone in the world. I was in the home of relatives, cruel and evil people who made my life bitter, and I have run away. And first love the bad... And Vrslav's abandoned chief took Esther's trembling hand and held it. He hurried towards the bandit's cave while his friend Bolish was given the task of bringing the girl there. Well, to make the story, Bolish arrived with the girl just after Rav Shafia left. Vrslav looked at her and began to question her. But Esther suddenly refused to tell where she came from. And then when the bandits came forward, listen to me, chief. Why don't you keep this pretty girl here? With us and take care for your wife. Esther fell down at the feet of the bandit and said, You can kill me, but you don't force me to do the thing. Take the honor of the Bashlam. The God is going to take care, care of you if you do this. He told Bolish to go to Vilna and see if the Jewish community would pay to redeem the girl. A lot of the discussion took place in Vilna whether to redeem the girl. Well, everybody had pity on the girl, but on the other hand, they couldn't afford it. Then one of the younger men said, Rabbi Menachem rose up, Gentlemen, I'll give the ransom money from my own pocket. After Rabbi Menachem handed over the money, Rasulov brought the frightened Esther to the home, uh, to the city, and she was brought to Rabbi Menachem's home. Rabbi Menachem brought Esther home. His wife get to greet her with joy. You poor girl. So young, so beautiful. Look how much hardship you had. And Esther replied, Yes, and you had to pay a very huge price for me. I'd like to serve you and be in your family. But Geta replied, No, my girl. You will not be my servant, but my friend, my sister, my daughter. Shem has prevented me from having children, and I see you as a wonderful gift. Rabbi Nachum's house was a true Jewish home. Esther very quickly began to feel at home. At Rabbi Nachum's home, she felt the spiritual calmness, and she was happier that she, uh, than she had been in the glorious palace. She was still afraid that somebody might come and take her back there. However, in this house, happiness did not last very long. Gitta was very sick. My beloved husband, I feel that the end is near. But you are still young, and you must live out your life. Menachem began to cry and begged his wife never to repeat what she had said, but in the end, it was clear that Gitta was right. After a few years, his wife became sick, and she suggested that the rabbi should marry Esther. As autumn arrived, Gitta indeed died. Two years later, Menachem married Esther, and two of them lived a happy life. Well, one day, a new decree, a new message passed around the Yidden, the prince, who was head of the government ministers, had just returned with his wife, with wife Maria. All of the protests and the begging against the decree didn't help. Esther looked into the matter, and she found out who the wife, the young prince. I'll go myself. See the princess, Esther said. And Rabbi Nachman asked her, what good will it do? So Esther was forced to stop hiding the story of her past. Rabbi Nachman was astonished to hear her story. That means... You're the girl who's Esther, the great courage, has been praising the stories. Go to Princess Maria. Let Hashem give you success. And Esther went to see the princess. Princess Maria was sitting in the palace, and now she's, well, basically queen, and she had some memories of her beloved friend Esther. And then the door opened, and a servant girl ushered Esther in the room. She went to fall on Maria and embrace her, but she held her back and asked Maria, Didn't you want, didn't you want to save a Jewish girl as a friend? And Maria replied, Yes, poor Esther, who was burned to death in a great fire. And Esther said, 
You're wrong, guys. They're the not like. Do you remember the tall tree that stood near the bedroom? Even though she was treated very well, she ran away because the people kept trying to convince her to change her religion. Esther bent down and took Maria's hand in her own and kissed her. She said, Can you ever forgive your friend Esther? I am Esther, the one who I've mourned such a long time. Maria jumped up for a moment and she stood shocked and then she fell over Esther. Esther, my daughter and her sister! Now I'm happy I'm to see you. My beloved friend, you must forgive me. I'm the one who has to forgive you. Well, the prince heard his wife's cries and came to see what happened. My good husband, I'm crying from laughter. I'm happy. How happy I am. This is my friend and colleague. I never expected to see her again. The prince was down there and he was happy as his wife. And then he suddenly asked Maria, was Maria was Esther ever given a reward for saving a life after all? She ran away and was never given re any reward. After a moment of thought, the prince said, Esther, my wife's dear sister, I'm willing to give you the fine of 1,000 gold coins that I demand from the Jewish community of Vilna. You can collect the money and do with it whatever you want. Of all, of course, all the Yidden understood that Esther would not take any money from them, and the news quickly spread throughout the cities. Shul filled the with Yidden and came to thank Hashem for sending Esther. Meanwhile, Rav Shafsi continued writing his important book, Stifte Kohn, known by its abbreviation, the Shach. He wanted to print it out. But he didn't have the necessary money. Menachem and his wife Esther were happy to have Rav Shafsi as a guest. Well, the rabbi did not recognize Esther just as she did not recognize him. After he gave the speech, he raised his uh, raised his cup and said, L'chaim, to the life of the great rabbi Shafsi and the one of the people, to the life of our host, son-in-law of the king. Rav Shafsi heard this and was amazed. How could his Yiddish host be the son-in-law of a Christian kings. The people explained to him that Rav Shem Menachem's wife was Esther, who was once adopted by a king. Rav Shem heard all this. And he went pale. He was like, what? But this girl Esther was burnt to death in the king's palace. And the people answered, no, she ran away. And she suffered many troubles. And here she is in front of you. Just at that moment, Esther came in. Rav Shem looked at her. said, my own Esther, my dear daughter. He took hold of Esther and gave her a warm hug. Father, father, Esther cried. Rav Shem and Esther Spent many, many hours telling each other what happened in their lives. They both remember what Esther's mother had said. You will have troubles and I'm going to come and save you. <laughs> Rabbi Nachum donated all the money needed to print Rav Shafsi's book. And, yeah. And this book, the commentary on the Shulchan Aruch and, the, and a lot of uh, for the uh, Yidin to study this book to very day. You can also study it, but you should remember it's a very special story how it came about. Anyways, we're going to go to our Parsha Riddle. How did Moshe know the shape of the Menorah? Wow, it's such a great story. Nisan, what do you say? No? Unbelievable. Wait. It's an unbelievable story. And it's not such a well-known story, you know? It's really not such I, a well-known story. I want to tell you that it was uh, in a production of a Territorial Girls. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, it's, a really, it's yes. a really wonderful story. And I, I really got very inspired about the story. And uh, yeah, and uh, you know, I'm uh, really looking forward to uh, having more stories and uh, you know, more inspirational stuff because every time I do the show, it's uh, I'm getting every week more inspiration. Anyways, we have to end up soon. So, well, for the partial riddle, the partial question: How did Moshe know how to shape the Monero? Please answer it by texting me three four seven nine two seven three two seven nine. Sponsorship is available, and to advertise, of course. Email me, nukashroinyhour at gmail.com. And don't hesitate to, of course, email Radio Hidabru, JRU Radio, of course. Uh, Nisim, the email of the uh, how to advertise with you. No, the best way is to text us, 347-927-8398, 347-927-8398. Okay. And I want to say that to remind all the kids, the talent kids, that we know that all of you, basically, uh, yeah, you, you are... Um, uh, more than welcome to participate in the Kishoni hours. We are looking for a new uh, Kishoni, uh, what do you call it, uh, reporters, junior reporter, junior uh, Magid, and all the rest. Uh, J Root Radio is listen to, uh, listen to you and the kids you have to yeah, listen to. Yeah, and uh, okay, okay, this has been the Kishoni hour. Official Shakta follows me with But some... before we have a song, special Hold on. Song. Oh, you forget the... My special song, song. yes. Okay. This that's is your coming request, up, uh... request of. Special people, Ribbono Shel Olam, okay? Yeah. Okay.
Thank you, 